Hey everyone, I have three really, really awesome stories for you all tonight, but before we get into them, I want to point you over toward The Graveyard Shift. It is my podcast, which is basically every single video on my channel, but just in audio form. And I do plan on doing some podcast-only, maybe shorter stories over there eventually, but until then, head over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor, pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts. Search up The Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis and give me a follow. I would really appreciate it. And if it's possible on the platform you choose, leave me a high rating as well. That would be really, really awesome. If you're new here and you're just checking out the channel for the first time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. And you can also become a member to get videos a day early. If any of that sounds like anything you would like or enjoy, you know where to find all the buttons to do so. Now. Let's get into tonight's stories. Diary of a Downward Spiral Personal Diary of Felicity Beaumont March 21st Dear Diary Oh, God, I haven't done something like this since I was a little girl. It just sounds so silly coming from me now. It's amazing how life can change in the blink of an eye. A couple of months back, I was in peak physical condition to run a marathon. Now I'd be lucky to hobble to the bathroom. How did all this happen? (laughs) It's a good question, and I can hardly remember myself. The last thing I remember is visiting a friend's house for a Christmas party and then waking up in the ICU barely being able to move. To my understanding, black ice was the culprit. I guess it was the airbag that saved my life or what was left of it. So here I am now. The doctors recommend that I start writing things down. They say it'll help me better keep my emotions in check and maybe even jog my memory. Jog my memory. Maybe I should choose my words a little more carefully. Everyone tells me how lucky I am to be alive, but you know what? That's bullshit. I'm supposed to tell the truth here, if only here. Anyone who thinks we're lucky for existing is too stupid to understand that they are, in fact, worse things than dying. I haven't slept well for fucking months now. The funny thing about tossing and turning is that you don't start to appreciate it until you can't do it anymore. And I keep hearing voices coming from upstairs. When I finally do get to sleep, I'm haunted by the hellish nightmares of that accident. It's the same horrifying images played on loop each time, my body being meshed compressed along with the cold hard steel from the car my body ended to forming some kind of demented sandwich every morning I wake up and spend a good minute or so trying to force myself out of the bed eager to pour myself a cup of coffee and take on the day the sight of my bed sores and the agonizing pain that comes with them snap me back to reality really quick okay Okay, enough negativity for today. I have to remember what the psychologist said. Try your best to focus on the positive. I hate to break it to you, Doc, but once you've been run off the road going 70 miles an hour, the rose-tinted spectacles you've been wearing your entire life tend to turn to shit. Here I am now, laying in a hospital bed set up in my family room can't even go upstairs in my own bed. And with this string of burglaries that's been going on lately, anyone could get in here in the middle of the night and I'd be completely helpless. My husband Jack said he'll take care of it though and make sure nothing happens to me. At the very least, I guess I do in fact have him to be thankful for. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for him, I don't know what I would have done. Poor thing was in the passenger seat that night. He had too much to drink that night and was riding shotgun. I've seen pictures of what's left of the car, and believe me when I tell you that that side took the brunt of it. 
the look on my hubby, though, other than some bumps and bruises, he'll be back to his old self in no time. Even though he wasn't driving, I think he still feels a little guilty for what happened. He has to work a lot, but he made sure to get me the most expensive caretaker he could find to watch over me when he could not be there. She seems great, I'll give her that, but for the money, I would think she would have a slightly better attendance record. What was her name again? Alexa... something or other. My mind's drawing a blank right now. Although the doctors won't admit it. I think this medicine is fucking with my head. It always has. But what can I do? I gotta take it. Asthma in a bedridden patient is a big no-no. The last thing I need is to catch pneumonia. Thank goodness for Jack and Alexa. They make sure I never miss a dose. I think that's enough for now. I'm kind of tired. Hopefully I won't need this hospital bed much longer. I miss going upstairs and sleeping next to Jack. It's too bad this damn hospital bed was only built for one. March 28th. Dear Diary. No. You know what? Dear God. I wish I was dead. Why couldn't he just kill me and be done with it? There's a lot of things I can put up with, but there's a limit to this nightmarish hell that I'm willing to endure. Did I ever tell you that I can't even wipe my own ass anymore? Nurse or no nurse, I don't care if you have a whole squad of caretakers on standby. Words cannot even begin to describe how much that hurts your pride. But wait, there's more. I had myself a little accident today. Alexa sat me up on the toilet today to do my business. Everything was going okay until the telephone started to ring. I don't know what possessed her to do this, but she left me in there alone while she ran to go get it. I wound up falling at a weird angle and banging my face against the sink. Now I look like I went 15 rounds with Mike Tyson. The three of us had to talk about it when Jack got home from work. Turns out, she was under orders from him to make sure the phone got answered. I guess he was expecting an important phone call. I'm glad to know Jack's job takes precedent over me. It's nice to know where I stand. <laughs> where I stand. Look at me, there I go again. I talked to him about it after she left. He apologized profusely and promised that from now on, Alexa is to, under no circumstances, talk on the phone while I'm in her care. That was all I got, and I'm sorry, and an assurance that it wouldn't happen again. My head was killing me, and he didn't even offer to massage my neck or anything. He told me he'd have his Amazon Echo to remind him to pick up some cream from my eye. I don't think Jack realizes that I can still remember where he keeps his gun. He's lucky I can't get up out of this bed by myself. This room would do some redecorating and I think my brains would be the perfect shade of red. I'm no gun expert, but I did in fact take a photography class in high school. The general idea is basically the same. You just point and shoot. April 20th. Dear Di- You know what? Forget it. That's too childish. Down to business. I'm sorry it has been so long since I've last written. I promised the doctor I'd try to maintain a more consistent schedule. It has all been for good reason, though, I assure you. I'm sorry about my last post. I, I was in a very dark place, but I've had some good long sessions with my psychologist, and after a swift medication change, I think I'll be okay. Plus, where my future once seemed bleak and uncertain, I now have a glimmer of hope. I've been working extra hard, both at physical therapy and back at home here with Alexa. I'm proud to report that some of my movement has started to come back. I'm now able to hoist myself up in bed and sit up for a little bit. The doctors were very pleased for me. 
They say, if I keep this up, I might even be able to walk again. Granted, it would most likely be with a cane, and I wouldn't be running a marathon anytime soon, but it'd be so nice to be able to walk upstairs again, to get to sleep in my own bed again. Unfortunately, that's where the good news stops. I wish Jack would have been more excited. He barely said two words on the ride home. He was too preoccupied with his damn phone. Must have taken us 20 extra minutes to get home. We hit every goddamn red light on the way. If he wasn't checking a text, he was yelling into that stupid thing. Siri, do this. Siri, remind me about that. Talk to me, you son of a bitch. I might have banged my head a little on the accident, but I'm not an idiot. I'm your wife. Let me help you. Take your eyes off the phone and talk to me. At least tell me who you're texting. That'd be something to talk about, but no. He's been so secretive lately, and I can't stand it. Ever since the accident, he's been this way. He says he loves me, but his heart just isn't in it. At first, I was grateful he got Alexa to help out, but now I'm starting to think it was just more convenient for him to pay someone rather than deal with me himself. I don't know. I guess I'm done for now. I'm exhausted. Those damn voices won't let up. April 27th. I haven't been sleeping well lately. Remember the voices I was hearing? I feel like they're getting louder. I didn't get to sleep until around 5 a.m. this time. Jack keeps saying he doesn't hear anything. I don't know how he can't. I swear they must be coming right from our room. He keeps telling me that I'm just dreaming it, but I can tell the difference between dreams and reality. I'm only having one dream, and it's still the nightmare of the accident. These voices are all too real. One of these days, I'll be strong enough to get out of this bed, and I'm going to confront them. I know that I'm not crazy. Alexa didn't show up today. According to Jack, she wasn't feeling well, so it was just the two of us today. And I must admit, he did seem a bit more attentive than normal. We actually had a halfway pleasant day. Even though I was pretty tired, he actually managed to take my mind off it. He picked me up just like he did when he carried me through the door when we first bought the house, and he placed me into the passenger seat of his convertible. We had a pleasant drive in the country, and for dinner he took me where he had our first date. He apologized for being so tired with work lately, and presented me with a bottle of perfume, both as a gift for doing so well with my therapy and an apology. The bottle was partially empty, but I didn't care. Stuff isn't easy to find anymore said he got it at a garage sale. He knows how much I love old-fashioned stuff. At least he was thinking of me. I was so excited I could hardly contain myself. I think that's enough for now. It's nice not being able to sleep from excitement. I never thought I'd feel this way again. April 28th. Damn, son of a bitch. I can't believe it. Does he think I'm some kind of idiot or something? I refuse to put up with this. Alexa came back to work today. She smelled awfully familiar. I cannot believe that I didn't notice this before. That bitch was wearing perfume. The same kind that Jack claimed he found for me. I'll bet he looked really hard, all right. I can't believe I didn't see it before. Alexa's absences, Jack's clandestine phone calls, him being constantly preoccupied, and those voices. I wasn't imagining them at all. And that bastard had me thinking maybe I really was imagining it. I'm not going to stand for this, literally. If I wasn't determined to walk again before, I for sure am now. I'm not going to let him make a fool out of me. He will pay for this.
May 26th. I think this will be my last entry for a while. I'm sorry I've been gone so long again. I had to take some time to myself. It's all been worth it, though. Unfortunately for my husband, my dreams have been coming in nice and clear lately. I remember everything now. That night of the accident, my husband was in the passenger seat. After he put himself there. One of us drank too much that night, and it was him. I was never the designated driver. I've been training harder than I ever thought possible, both at therapy and here at home. I decided to put my sleepless nights to good use and get in some extra exercise. No one knows this. Not Alexa, not my husband, nobody. I can walk again. I've had to hide it from everyone. I'm not in tip-top shape yet, and my balance is very shaky, and I'm not the fastest, but I think I can do the stairs. I can hear the two of them talking up there right now. I think I'll drop in and pay them a little visit. Oh boy, they are going to be surprised. I found where Jack moved his gun. I guess he isn't as good as hiding things as he thought he is. It's time to end this. I hope he burns in hell for what he did to me. To whoever reads this first, my doctor, the authorities, I'm sorry. But this was the only way. This is a Channel 7 News Bulletin. We begin tonight with the tragic story of a domestic abuse situation turned deadly. 32-year-old Felicity Beaumont was found dead late yesterday afternoon after her caretaker arrived late for a shift to find her laying motionless at the bottom of the stairs, clutching a 9mm pistol in her hand. Her husband, 34-year-old Jack Beaumont, was found clinging to life in the couple's bedroom after suffering a severe gunshot wound to the chest. When he was discovered, he could still be heard muttering into his Amazon Echo saying, Alexa, dial 911. Authorities believe Mrs. Beaumont to have been brandishing the firearm when she slipped down the stairs, causing her to break her neck. Night of the Burning Men We awoke around midnight to the incessant blaring of sirens. Dawned in their slippers and nightgowns, a few brave souls ventured onto their porches while most of us remained inside, glued to our windows. Jacob, my husband, asked me if he had still been dreaming, to which I replied with equal uncertainty, I don't know. A part of me held out hope that our consciousnesses had somehow melded into a collective nightmare that none of us were going to remember come morning. Unfortunately, as soon as I grabbed onto his hand and felt it tremble in my own, I knew that this was as real as it gets. They marched down the streets in single file, the burning men. Past the flames that engulfed their bodies were the charred remnants of actual people, scorched to beyond recognition. They shouldn't have been alive, and yet they trudged on, flesh dripping off them like lax with each strenuous step. Fire erupted from their orifices, spewing forth from their mouths and eye sockets as though it came from somewhere deep within. The local authorities that had arrived on the scene simply stood on the sidewalks, kept at bay by the heat. Most of them were probably questioning the legitimacy of what they were witnessing, same as the rest of us. Jacob compared the horrifying spectacle to some sort of parade, an exposition that celebrated the unmaking of subsequent cleansing of human form. Though I dared not to admit it at the time, the symbolism wasn't lost on me in spite of the innate revulsion. The congregation was led by a woman whose body and priestly attire were somehow unscathed by the fire. In one hand she held a leather-bound book and in the other a golden scepter. She guided her followers around our sleepy little cul-de-sac, her chanting accompanied by a chorus of moans and the sizzling of human meat. 
as she passed by our driveway, closely tailed by the queue of blazing husks, I was able to make out the smile plastered across her wrinkled face. Contrary to my own expectations, the woman didn't come across as deranged or maniacal at all. Rather, she simply looked overjoyed, as though this moment was the culmination of her entire life's work. Reluctantly, an onlooking firefighter finally decided to intervene and threw a bucket full of water onto one of the burning men. We watched the shriveled figure stumble out of line, drop to the pavement, and begin to convulse. Its groans turned to shrieks of agony, its limbs bent and flared out in awkward directions. Steam rose from the writhing creature that had once presumably been human. And then it fell limp reduced to a horrifically disfigured carcass, and nothing more. The marching and the chanting ceased. The burning men stood eerily still, only swaying while the fire ate away at their forms. The silence that followed was rife with suspense, for we all knew it was merely the calm before the storm. A couple of the abominations turned their melted faces in the direction of the now terror-stricken firemen, who dropped the empty bucket and slowly retreated onto our driveway. I saw the priestess raise her staff toward the sky, involuntarily guiding my eye to it as well. I'm not sure what I saw up there that night, but it sure as hell wasn't the moon. It was shaped like a moon, gave off light like a moon, but it wasn't our moon. I don't know how else to describe it apart from looking like it didn't belong there. Like if you were to glue a cutout onto the canvas of a painting, it it was masculine, scornful, the eye of a furious god glaring down at us like an abusive father. Whatever it was, it loathed our very existence. I cupped Jacob's face and turned his terrified expression toward me. His lips trembled, his bloodshot eyes filling with tears. My heart sank as I saw a pair of glowing circles appear around his pupils, gradually replacing the familiar brown of his irises. Somehow, I knew it was about to happen, yet I refused to accept it. No, 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 I pleaded, attempting to embrace him, but he shoved me away with every ounce of his strength. My back slammed against the wall and I slid halfway down before regaining my footing. When I looked up, I saw him standing there with his arms hanging by his sides and head tilted at an angle. Tears evaporated from his eyes. Go! was the last thing he managed to get out before a torrent of fire erupted from his mouth. The flames burnt holes through his cheeks and soon engulfed his entire jaw, exposing his gums and singeing his teeth. I shielded my face from the wave of heat that swept across our bedroom. He turned away from me and wrapped his arms around his stomach, groaning painfully while everything in his general vicinity caught fire. I wanted to help him, to save him, but I didn't know how. I was forced to helplessly witness his identity get stripped away piece by piece. When I next saw Jacob's face, there was nothing left of the man I'd spent 15 years of my life with. Only a pair of hollow sockets stared back at me. So I ran. I threw myself at the bedroom door, bursting through it, and then stumbled down the stairs in a haze of panic and grief. There were gunshots outside, followed by screams for help. I whizzed past the kitchen window, catching glimpses of a female police officer unloading rounds into a group of the burning men, which at best only staggered the creatures. My bare feet slapped against the cold tiles as I charged toward the screen door that led into the backyard. I tripped and bumped into furniture. Something behind me fell and shattered, scattering into jagged shards that pierced my soles, but I was too high on adrenaline to register the pain. Wheezing, I dropped to my hands and knees under the trimmed grass outside. My heart pounded in my ears, almost drowning out the walls of entire families being burnt alive by their own husbands and fathers. 
Whatever that thing in the sky masquerading as our moon was, it turned every man whom gazed up into it into a mindless harbinger of its wrath. My shadow stretched before me, outlined and warped by the light of our home in flames. Smoke filled my lungs. Everything that I had once taken for granted was stolen from me in a matter of moments. My marriage, my refuge, my life. I turned around and watched all of it burn. The sight of the monster, formerly known as my husband, violently slamming the exposed framework of his face against the upstairs window still haunts me every time I close my eyes. I couldn't tell whether he was trying to escape his fiery prison or to get to me, though I suppose it doesn't really matter. I hardly reacted as more of them started climbing over the fence. One by one, they flopped onto our lawn like rag dolls, scorching the ground where they landed before rising back to their feet and slowly sauntering toward me, encircling me. I remained unfazed. I had already lost everything. What was there left to fear? I regarded the living wall of burning flesh surrounding me with apathy. Their moans filled the night, yet all I heard were the cries of innocent souls trapped in infernal vessels, forced to carry out the will of something far greater than themselves. For what reason, I don't know, and I fear that by the time we find out, it will be much too late. As they began to approach, I calmly made my way over to the garden faucet protruding from the side of the house and turned its valve while redirecting water to the sprinkler system. I was discovered by a rescue team the following morning, soaked to the bone and sitting among the dozen of shriveled, waterlogged corpses littering the backyard of my once idyllic suburban home now reduced to a pile of smoldering rubble. Being one of the few survivors, I was the first to be interrogated about what happened that night. You can probably guess how many people believed my recollection, and frankly, I don't blame them. I don't expect you to believe me either, but do me a favor instead. Appreciate what you have while you have it. Embrace a loved one, spend time with your favorite pet, or work on something that fulfills you, because someday, soon, all of it will be taken away from you. It's coming. And it hates us. The Door in the Tree I know these woods like the back of my hand. Being a ranger around these parts, I've spent a lot of time taking in the beautiful scenery. I can tell you God knows how many different stories about brawls I've broken up, kids smoking weed out here, and even reports of stalkers just in this area alone. Okay, in all honesty, I haven't exactly broken anything up, but I have assisted those who have. I'm not the best at confrontation, but I'm trying to get better about it. Some of the guys make fun of me for not being more forceful when it's necessary, but that's not my scene. The forest surrounding Grady National Park wraps at least half of the city. We've had plenty of bizarre rumors and such, dating back to long before the series of strange deaths when I was just a toddler. I suppose most small towns have their fair share of unsettling stories in their history. Even over the years, I've been a ranger, people would go missing on occasion, or some freaked-out tourists may claim they have seen some bizarre things. Sometimes a dismembered body will show up, which I have fortunately not been around for, as I'm not great with the sight of blood. Still, I could barely wrap my mind around what happened that day. Granted, my mind wasn't what it used to be. The car accident that claimed the life of my mother back when I was in junior high not only left my heart heavy, but changed me as well. The truck that ran the red light, plowing into the passenger side of my father's car, landed me in a comatose state almost immediately. A month or so afterward, I came out of it, but the damage to my brain took some time to repair. 
While I was once a stellar student, on my way to bigger and better things before that wreck, the time it took for me to recover from my injuries, as well as my altered brain function, left me a shadow of the man I could have been. The loss of my mom, the dramatically altered parenting style of my heartbroken dad, and my inability to focus the way I used to made life far more difficult over the following years. My father was still a loving guardian, but we grew more distant over time. I knew he was hurting, but I was too. I just wish we could have remained as close as we once were after we shared such a devastating loss. For the accident, we would take a camping trip at least once a year. Considering that it was as we made our way back from that final vacation that our family was left in ruins, there wouldn't be any more excursions out into the wilderness or anywhere else for my old man and I. Though that last trip had such an impact on my life, I still had so many fond memories of those happier times. I think that's why I ended up settling on this particular profession. It may seem a bit morbid to some, as this is the same spot we used to frequent in my youth, the one we had only just left behind before the accident, but I couldn't blame such a beautiful place for a tragic event. I still felt connected to it in a strange sort of way. Maybe it's simply because it was the last place where I felt really content. Perhaps it was just my inherent love of nature, and being there made me feel closer to my mom, if that makes sense. Yes, she died not far from here, but this was the last place I saw her smile, something that was always contagious. I like to keep moving, for the most part. Some of the guys keep to specific areas, plus they're a hell of a lot more social to the residents and tourists, but I like to take in the sights as much as I can while being left alone, if possible. It's beautiful countryside out here, so there's no shortage of spots to just immerse yourself in the wonder of it all. This clearing right next to the lake where the waterfall from high above cascades onto the rapids has always been one of my favorites. I couldn't even tell you how many recordings I've captured over the six years I've been a ranger, but I always find myself coming back to this place. Not to sound like I'm pushing aside my responsibilities or anything like that, but I've taken quite a few naps, leaned up against the base of the mountain, and just drank in the ambience. Of course, as soon as I wake up, I end up having to find the nearest tree, as passing out next to rushing water has quite the effect on the bladder, but it's a fair trade for the peacefulness of it all. It was after coming back to the waking world one day that I noticed it for the first time. Many of the trees surrounding the clearing are ancient, wide, and tall, damn near reaching as high as the peak of the mountain. While I shambled over one of the more secluded trees, tucked away from any wandering eyes by the shadows cast by the rock formations above, I noticed the light of the setting sun reflecting off something. At first I almost thought someone was out there, shining and flashing in my direction, exposing my draining bladder to the world, but I would be very mistaken about that assumption. After taking care of my business, I wandered over to where the glow was coming from, immediately puzzled by what stood before me. The tree was a beast. Its trunk as wide as my truck is long, reaching so high you could very possibly step right off the mountain and onto the branches. Being one of the more imposing in this area, I knew it pretty well, or was at least familiar enough with it to know that it wasn't like this before. The simple black wooden door was recessed about a foot into it, the shiny brass knob catching the light as the sun sank away behind the mountain. It did look painted, if that makes sense. It was more like the wood the door was constructed from was black or possibly burnt. I hesitantly ran my fingers across it, surprised by how smooth it was. It felt like stroking a chrome-bladed bumper rather than a door that looked as though it belonged in a creepy old house. It was that very thought that inspired me not to attempt to open it. 
the idea of some sinister mansion being somehow tucked away in the guts of an enormous tree. I came close, wrapping my hand around the shiny knob protruding from the bizarre entrance to God knows what, but after a moment, I let go. It may sound a bit nuts, but when I grabbed that knob, everything fell silent around me. Being that the door was facing the waterfall, maybe about 20 or 30 feet from it at that moment, it may as well have been 20 miles away. It was as though some impenetrable wall suddenly formed around where I stood, blocking out the sounds of the rushing water, the wind gently brushing the leaves, and the cars drifting by on the interstate off in the distance. Though I was quite curious about what may lie behind the door, I was feeling more unsettled than anything. I just backed away from the thing as if it had held me at gunpoint. The further I got from it, the more my head cleared up, which was enough to convince me to head back to the station. During my walk, I was arguing with myself about whether or not to tell some of the other guys about this while attempting to convince myself that I was just seeing things. It's not unusual for me to see strange things after waking up, my mind with one foot still in the dream and the other dragging along in the real world. By the time I reached the cabin that we worked out of, I had shaken the whole thing off, deciding it was best to not give the guys a reason to look at me like I'm crazy. It was still on my mind, of course. The unusual door, as well as the way it made me feel, but that part only assured me that I was still half asleep at the time. A week or so passed before I went back out there to see no trace of the door, just the thick trunk and rough bark staring back at me. I still felt a bit uneasy about dozing off out there, even if the absence of the bizarre entrance to something else convinced me of my suspicions about it not being real. It was probably a month or two after that day that I would find myself face to face with it again. It wasn't as I patrolled, but as I headed home for the night. The nearby highway that ran parallel to the waterfall was the second step in my usual return trip, after the back roads from the cabin to the wider two-laned road. There wasn't much traffic that night, so I kept an eye on the path ahead and another thumbing through my playlist in search of music for the ride. It was during that silence, as I sought out my driving soundtrack, that I heard the screaming. I practically skidded into the ditch as it caught my wandering mind by surprise so much that I jumped in my seat. I pulled over to the side of the road next to the woods that would lead to that waterfall, hearing that muffled wailing again. While I was reluctant to seek out the source of the agonized howl, I felt a strange sort of compulsion to pursue it. Though I'm not one to look for a fight if I don't have to, something inside me was begging me to check it out. I didn't want to come off like a coward or anything, but on any normal day, I try to avoid conflict like the plague. Not this one, though. I wasn't certain how far into the woods the sound was coming from, but I pulled the heavy flashlight from the center console and headed directly into the forest without giving it a second thought. Though I was quite familiar with the area, it didn't make sprinting between the trees with only the torchlight illuminating the path ahead any easier. Still, the louder the screaming grew, the more I was certain I was on the right track. After about 10 to 15 minutes of forcing my quickly weakened legs onward, I cleared the denser woods that led to that clearing. As soon as I passed through to where those thicker, far more ancient trees surrounded the cascading waterfall, the screaming fell silent. It almost felt like it was some insanely realistic recording that ended the moment I set foot in that area. I panned my flashlight around the vicinity, desperate to locate the source of that pain-filled squeal. But there was nobody out there. Not that I could see, anyway. It wasn't until I stepped a few more places forward, passing by the first of the thicker trunks, that I saw something that almost caused my fingers to lose their grip on my guiding light. The warm glow emanating from the cracked open door recessed into that same enormous tree, almost looking inviting at first. 
There was only an inch of light peering through the opening, making me wonder if someone had meant to close the door, neglecting to allow it to latch all the way. That was a theory that made sense anyway, even if the door itself made none. As I walked closer, my torch bounced against my upper thigh as my arm swung limp beside it. I felt that same bizarre sensation of walking into a tunnel. Just as it had before, the sound of the rushing water and wind sweeping through the branches drew further away with every step. When I stopped right in front of the thing, it was as though my head was dunked in the lake, pillows strapped around my ears. The worlds felt so far away from where I stood, my body beginning to slightly spasm from the cold and eerie grip of that warm hue leaking from within. Before my mind had a chance of grasping what my body was doing, my palm pressed against the slick wood, nudging the entrance open a little more. The hinges squealed like a mouse caught in a trap as the glow from whatever lay within that tree grew wider and wider, tracing my shadow across the autumn leaves behind me. While I could make out the sound of the rushing water to my back, the further the door swung open, the more I could hear the rapids on the other side. The vision of that same riverbed I'd slept next to more times than I can count caused me to turn my head to ensure the one behind me was still there. Sure enough, that very waterfall was both behind and before me as I stood in front of that splayed open entrance. When that same scream echoed from somewhere beyond the threshold of that ancient tree, my somewhat reluctant instincts took over from my absent mind at the time, speeding me into the foreign and eerily familiar landscape. As soon as I passed through, darting my head from side to side in search of whoever may be in trouble out there, the sudden jarring sound of the door slamming shut almost caused me to leap out of my skin. Glancing back to see a white door recessed into the tree with the same brass knob protruding from it, I almost forgot what had inspired me to enter. Again, I moved closer, back the way I came, hearing the ambient sounds of my new location fading further away. Though the screaming met my ears again, it was far more muffled than the last, taking me a moment to register. When the distant, help, joined the wailing, though, I finally snapped my senses back to the situation at hand. With the terrain being so familiar to me, I began to head to the left of the waterfall, where a trail should lead up around the side of the mountain. It wasn't until I ran almost straight into a wall that I would often rest against that I understood in what manner this place differed from the one I left behind. After studying the flat, rocky surface for a moment, I made for the right opposite direction from the one I was more familiar with. Every west I knew was east here, like a mirror image of the world I left behind. Though I wanted to dwell on this more to unlock the mystery of my puzzling location, I had no time to waste with whoever provided that scream moving further away by the second. Everything I veered around as I ran quietly as I could in pursuit of the source of that agonized wail was so familiar to me but so foreign at the same time. Even the steep, uneven, and winding path turned in the opposite direction I was used to, but not in a way that caused me to stumble or slip. If anything, as bizarre as it may sound, I felt as though I could close my eyes and find my way around without a second thought. Perhaps it was nothing more than the way our mirror image is the one we know as opposed to how we look a little off in pictures or recordings. We can never truly look upon our own faces, not the way others can. These thoughts and realizations didn't fully form in my mind until I ran into another clearing, near the midway point in the trail. It wasn't the three other scattered bodies, two male and another female, bleeding from various wounds either. The man who was tying the rope around the screaming girl, however... He inspired me to stop in my tracks. I thought this might be enough to grab your attention, he said, my own voice sounding unnervingly confusing to my ears. I had no words of my own to offer the man with the exact same facial features as me. 
Everything about him was like I was gazing into my reversed reflection, down to the scar across my right eyebrow, his being on the left. The uniform he wore, down to the scuffed up belt buckle, was the same as mine, just a slightly darker color scheme. When he smiled, raising the left side of his mouth a little higher than the right, again mimicking my mirror image, I felt the blood drain from my face, my head spinning from this bizarre sight. I wasn't going to hurt her, he said, a shrug accompanying his familiar grin. Not until you got here, anyway. No, I yelled out, my quivering legs attempting to push me toward him as he unclipped my father's pocket knife from his belt. I couldn't even hope to close the gap between us in time. I convinced my trembling extremities to move before he flipped open the blade, digging it into her chest. Blood streamed to the forest floor as he turned it from side to side, gaping the wound wider as he twisted his wrist, the woman only moaning as she had no strength left to scream. My legs burned, and my heart beat like a stampeding herd as I drew close enough to tackle him, taking us both to the ground. Wait! He barked, his words stomping short as my fist met his jaw, causing us both to recoil from the hit. I tumbled to the side of him, wrapping my hand around my swelling jaw while he did the same. After a moment, we just stared at one another, with his whimpering victim falling silent. It was at that moment I fully understood the gravity of the situation while we both wiped the blood from our split lower lips. What the hell are you? I asked, gasping for breath. You don't recognize me? That's not an answer. What the hell are you? He cut his eyes from me to the scattered corpses on the grass, to the lifeless woman with blood still trickling from her chest and mouth, and back to me again. I'm your better half, he said, a sinister smile reaching across his lips. This was the first moment in which I could see myself in his face. His piercing gaze seemed to darken as he bared his teeth in a way that made him completely foreign to me. I won't let you go. I won't let you... What exactly? He said, the smile fading from his face. You won't let me kill again. Is that what you think? How are you going to pull that off? You can't hurt me without hurting yourself. Even your stupid ass can figure out that. You got some freaking nerve. How exactly am I any dumber than you? For one, you think you can reason with me. Or stop me from... Being what I was born to be. Two. I was always the better part of us. In that second, the puzzle pieces fell into place as though a veil was lifted from my eyes. Though it was not easy to deny facts that I was quite literally confronted with, I refused to accept what he was implying. That it was he that I lost in the accident that stole my mother from me and my dad. We're all two parts, buddy, he said, interrupting my reeling thoughts. One good, one, well, not so much. The doctors told me that my brain was damaged in that collision, that I lost part of myself, but that couldn't have been literal, right? We're not two physical beings trapped in one fleshy husk. No, I wouldn't believe it. There was no part of me capable of doing what he did. My whole life, I'd never so much as heard a fly, not if I could help it. Though I wasn't the sharpest kid in high school, I never mocked or insulted one. My teachers would practically brag about my behavior to my dad, even if it was to soften the blow of my grades not being the best. I had... It would never hurt... Wait. It's not quite true, is it? Yes, I was smart in junior high and kindergarten. Gifted, my teachers would even say. But that's not all I was, was it? I was egotistical. Arrogant. Cold. I treated my popular friends well while pushing around the smaller and less fortunate kids. 
I was a bully. You're getting there, my reflection sent, that unsettling grin breaching his lips again. I... I like who I am. I, I like who I am without you, I said, the weight of my former self weighing heavily on my conscience. Ain't about what you like anymore, he said, walking closer. Neither of us can be right until we're whole again. Back the hell off, I shouted, drawing my heavy flashlight like a sword. You want to stop me, don't you? Only two ways that can happen. I'm serious. Back th one. You can beat me senseless with your little toy there and hope to God you can end me before you bleed dry yourself. You're not to. You can let me back in. You can let me come home. Never, I said, shaking my head in denial. I'll never let you in. Ain't like you'll go around snuffing folks out when we're whole again, he said, tossing our dad's pocket knife to the ground. I'm only like this because I'm undiluted. Got no happy, happy thoughts bouncing around in the old noodle. It's the same reason you're such a fucking pussy. You're all sunshine and rainbows, you see, and got no black blood pulsing through you. I felt the tears streaming down my face, both in denial of facts I was still fighting to deny, as well as what I may have to do to prevent him from getting what he wanted. Time to make a decision he said, hunching over as he drew closer, spreading his fingers like a cat about to pounce. Live or die, little boy. With that, he charged me, tackling me to the ground as I had to him only moments earlier. As we rolled on the dead leaves and grass, he thrust his fist into my gut, causing us both to cough and buckle from the impact. My elbow struck his chin, jarring my jaw so hard I feared I'd broken it. We continued like this until we were equally as bruised and bloody, each of us wincing from every blow we traded. By the time I pushed myself back from him, back in the direction I came from, I hadn't even realized how far we tumbled while we waged our battle of self-injury. I pushed up from the bumpy ground, my head spinning so much that I didn't realize it was not my dizziness that made my equilibrium so offset, but the steep slant I was next to at the time. No! My doppelganger screamed as I lost my footing, leaving me tumbling down the uneven path. It almost felt like I was moving in slow motion, seeing my own anguished face yelling out as his arms reached for me. I can't say whether it was my back meeting the slanted ground or the other me leaping into my midsection that felt more jarring at the time, but before I knew it, the two of us were tumbling down that hill, sharing more wounds as we bounced from rocks to dips in the path over and over. How long we careened from one object to the next as we poured like a poorly choreographed avalanche down that hill I couldn't even tell. When our descent finally came to a close, mud, dirt, and leaves pasted to the sticky blood leaking from God knows how many places on my body. I found myself just lying there, gazing up at the moon shining down from above. My conscience wavering every inch of my broken body, screaming in agony, my eyes fell shut, sending me once more into blissful darkness. I can't say if it was the ominous humming sound or my body being dragged across the ground that shot me back into consciousness, but my vision was still blurry at best. With the still uncertain condition I was in, I hadn't the strength or ability to fight against the hands gripped under my arms, pulling me from the spot where my fall came to a close. Stay with me, a gentle feminine voice spoke, one that felt so familiar and so distant at the same time. We're almost home, baby boy. When my eyes finally registered the now violently shuddering tree with the white door forming cracks in the trembling wood, my already thundering heart sank with the possibility of my way home crumbling apart before me. When the hands slipped free from around me, my bones clicking and crunching as I attempted to face the one who brought me this far, I heard the hinges of that ancient door swinging open. 
You have to go the rest of the way on your own, the voice said. I can't follow you through. My eyes finally met those I'd first seen in this world, the distant and forgotten memory of that moment shooting forward from the depths of my subconscious. Fresh tears blended with the thick blood crusted my cheeks, my chest burning from this wondrous vision. Go, she said, glancing from me to the door. You have to go, baby boy. There's no time. While my fractured heart begged me to stay, my weary and agonized shell fought to push me free of the hard ground. A warm hand cupped around my split and swollen face. I'll see you again, my love, she said, her lips forming that playful smile I adored since I formed my first thought. But not yet. I found myself standing on my own two feet, the shuddering open door to my back and the dark sky splitting like a sheet of heavily tinted glass. Not yet, my mom said, as the world around us crumpled apart, my body falling weightless through the opening to the one I belonged in. My eyes sprung back open, uncertain of when they'd close, with my back pressed to the glass and dirt. I sat straight up, running my fingers across my face in search of injury, only meeting my stumble in the process. The ancient, wide tree stood before me with no trace of a door in sight, only the centuries-old bark with the moonlight accentuating its hardening texture. My senses still reeling while my mind fought to recall where I had just been. Ultimately, after understanding that I was only recently on my way back home after a long day at work, I headed back in the direction of my truck, hoping it was still by the road where I left it. The next few days came and went in something of a haze. There were reports of some missing college kids, two male, two female, but there was no sign of where they went. The memories of my time behind that door took a while to fully reform in the back of my mind. It's not something I could really explain to anyone. Not only did I not want people to think I was nuts, but I wasn't about to tell them what or who had abducted the four who went missing. While the man I was before following the path they ended up taking may only be half of the one who came back. I won't be held responsible for what my sentient darker half did. Once upon a time, my consciousness would have been crippled beneath the weight of those deaths, but my more recently reclaimed logical mind understands that it wasn't truly my fault. It was he, well, I said, that he was the undiluted version after all. Whether it was that fall that linked us back together, or the actions of the one who saved me from being lost in that place, I suppose I'll never know. It is quite amazing, though, the feeling of being whole again for the first time in years. I still don't fully understand how I came back to this side with none of the injuries I received there. Perhaps it was more the split parts of my soul who faced off in that bizarre mirror world rather than the physical form of my fractured body. While that doesn't fully explain the missing teens, I suppose I'll never have all the answers to what happened that night, nor what truly occurred after that collision that ripped my family apart. Life goes on, regardless of any of that, when all is said and done. Though I'm planning to start taking some night classes to finally earn some sort of degree, I don't plan on quit being a ranger. I love my job, which is something that both sides of me can agree on. I suppose I just have something of a need to prove to myself that my brain is working as it used to before I ended up with quite the literal split personality. Don't worry. I don't have any desire to stalk and murder anyone. Well, not entirely. I have a few urges I didn't have before, but I'm certain it's nothing that I can control. Yes, I'm a little more broody than I was not so long ago, but also a good deal less cowardly, so that's something at least. Whatever happens from here, I'll neither be taking naps on the job nor revisiting that spot by the waterfall if I can help it. 
One thing I learned from all this is that there's far more to being content than being happy. It's not all sunshines and roses, but that's life. You have to take the bad with the good in the end. One cannot exist without the other, after all.